you can reverse it. You can get a do-over. And that's the joy of, of what you're doing is, and, and what I'm doing is still trying to, in fact, teach people that, in fact, this is... It's all reversible. Your, well, well your a lot family, of it is reversible. Yeah. You don't have to live your family genes. The, whether you turn on those genes or not is what we've learned lifestyle does. And you're living the lifestyle and you're in... It's, it's mm-hmm. wonderful that you're living the lifestyle that, in fact, is not having to follow a genetic pathway of disease. It's a lot of, a lot of freedom for people once they realize that, I think. Hello, and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Hello to my Pursuing Health listeners. It's crazy to think that we are quickly approaching nine years and 300 episodes of the Pursuing Health podcast. This has been one of the most fun and rewarding endeavors of my life, and I'm not planning to stop anytime soon, but I thought it would be fun as we approach episode 300 to go back and revisit some of my all-time favorite episodes. Through this process, I have enjoyed meeting so many interesting people, hearing incredible stories, and connecting with all of you. So hopefully you will enjoy this episode and look forward to many more to come. Well, welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm really excited to be here with Dr. Mike Roizen, and thank you for welcoming me into your home, and Happy New Year. Thank you for coming (laughs) here. Happy New Year. It's great to see you. Yes, it's great to see you too. Um, I was just thinking in preparation for this conversation about kind of when I first came to the Cleveland Clinic for med school in 2011 and how I remembered I didn't know too much about the Cleveland Clinic, but I remembered reading about all they were doing with wellness and some of the more proactive things in terms of employee health and thinking about how lucky I was to be learning in this environment where, you know, the institution really valued wellness and health. And then later on, I realized that that's really the career path I wanted to take as well. And so it's been amazing to be able to learn in that environment and learn from you and everyone else at Cleveland Clinic. Well, you've really modeled it and you help the the young people who help motivate us old people. <laughs> um, but I should I should just put in a plug for what we've done because yeah. um, wellness was tried to be killed for, um, if you will, three years in a row by the chief financial officer or that group at the, because it was a cost and not saving money. But now it saves, I don't know, we have avoided spending over $660 million. That's incredible. $180 million. It, it augments as you get healthier, which is what pursuing health is all about, right? right? Getting people healthier to stay healthy. And that's really, 6% had what we call six plus two normals when we started in 2008. It's now 43.6% of those who participate. So huge change, um, highest group in the that we can find in the nation. And that's why it's saving this year. So much money. Yeah. And that's, so you're talking about the employee health program, which is, I think, you know, one of the, as far as the Cleveland Clinic goes, I think it was the first hospital, if not one of the first to, ban smoking on campus. It's to... the first large one to, we, we weren't the first to ban smoking on campus. We were the first to really exclude it okay. um, from our environment. In okay. other words, people had always said not inside the building and they were smoking within 20 feet of the building. We okay. took over the, the 16 by five block area and somewhere at all the other places, we took over that policing of that. So no place in the 16 by five block area. And we were really the first large one that didn't hire smokers. Wow. And then it went even further to, you know, getting rid of sugar sweetened beverages to, you know, changing the food in the cafeteria, getting rid of ta- trans fats, which now a lot of other hospitals have followed suit and are, are doing that as well. But really. Yeah, it's, it's the law in the United States now. Yeah. So, 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 but anyway, but, but, but also the first one that we, had free, um, if you will, uh, fitness centers for all of our employees. 
um, and give them a reward. So I say we've not spent six hundred and roughly seventy million dollars through two thousand and seventeen. It's probably another one hundred and fifty or one hundred and seventy. We haven't done the calculations in two thousand and eighteen. Wow, but in fact, in addition, the employees have had someplace over fifty million dollars in reduced premiums, plus another ton of money they've saved in copays, et cetera. So it's giving back to the employees, not only their health and fewer disability days, fewer sick days, but in addition, real money. Um, If an employee works for the Cleveland Clinic and um, has a family of four and puts it in a 4% HSA for the 30 years they work, they end up with an extra $200,000 at retirement. So there's a lot of benefit to it. That's a huge incentive. Um, So... Yeah, can you just explain for people listening how that works? So essentially, employees that are part of the employee health program, they can, you know, every year they have to meet certain... It's a voluntary program. So if they meet six criteria, uh, blood pressure under control, and uh, that's both determined by the primary care physician as well as the absolute 130 over 85 standard, LDL, LDL cholesterol, um fasting blood sugar, waist, uh, waist size or waist for height or body mass index or body fat, um, you'd be under the scale, right? Um, the uh, no cotinine in the urine. And then when we've gotten done this with other places, stress management program completed, we, we haven't brought that into the Cleveland Clinic as, a, as the sixth. The sixth is if they have asthma, have okay. it managed. Okay. Um, and cotinine is a measure of tobacco. Break correct. Down, correct. Okay. Correct. Um, and then, you know, if you have employees who have chronic health conditions or they're not meeting those, you offer so many resources for them to be able to actively start improving their health. Right. And so there's a, they get half of the benefit actually, um, roughly half of the benefit if they are on a plan and are on their way to achieving their goals. So you don't have to get there um, to get some of the reward. Some of the benefits. You're still incentivizing the healthy behaviors. Right. And even so, if you're not able to meet those markers right at right. this moment. So I should say, so the CEO and the board saved the wellness program and now they're, everyone's happy, including the, the financial officer. Right. So it's hard. I mean, it is hard to see that from a financial perspective beforehand because you're not seeing the savings until later on. It takes months and years in order to be able to see that. Right. And we made a ton of mistakes in doing it, you know, as any new program. So um, one of the things that was interesting is we um, started with smoking, thinking we would get the fastest return. Well, smoking actually has the slowest return on money. It takes about five years before the program that helped them get off cigarettes is paid for by less medical expenses for that. Interesting. Um, And other parts of it, we've learned what it has the fastest return as well. So, which is stress management. Stress management. Okay. Which is a harder one to measure probably. Um, It it actually isn't, although you'd think it was, but perceived stress is a pretty easy way of measuring it. If they complete a stress management program, that's what we look at. Because once people complete it, their stress levels go way down. down. There's so many ways of managing it. Amazing. And I know that you've worked with other companies to try to implement similar programs. Do you think that this is something that could be implemented on a national level or that could be implemented? And if not, why? why, Or what are some of the obstacles to making that happen? So the obstacles are that it takes a little while to get the return on investment. But now look at the return on investments. It's huge. Huge. Yeah. Um, so the answer is, yeah, that's why I'm still at the Cleveland Clinic, because you get the, the Cleveland Clinic gives you the opportunity to spread this to other places. So um, Portman, who's a Republican, and Wyden, who's a Democrat, have a bipartisan bill in Congress to do this with Medicare. Now, it's not going there, even though they've got three R's and three D's as co-sponsors, it's not gone anywhere because basically um, the Congress, if you will, uh, sees if they bring up something like that, everyone will attach other things to it and not it won't get the desired result. But we have moved a little bit along in getting a little rewards through the Medicare program. It's not done quite right to motivate it. 
my guess is over the next several years, we'll get to do this um, in several states, such as the state of Ohio and maybe uh, the state of Illinois and some parts of Tennessee have already spoken to us about doing this. And if if we can get there and get there, both the buy-in and, and the buy-in of, of all of the contract parties, then we can really see if we can do this. And I, we have to do it because if we don't, medical costs are, you know, the number of people doing CrossFit programs and pursuing health that way is just not enough. Right. We're going bankrupt our country without with all of these medical costs. So Correct. Well, that's exciting. And to think that, you know, if you can get a few more states involved and get more data and more buy-in, then hopefully more will follow suit. So right. that's yeah. very exciting. Yeah, that's the goal. Well, as so, you know, as you know, I, I try big, hairy, audacious goals. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's clearly working out. Um, actually, as I was looking through some of your many accomplishments um, preparing for this interview, I, it, I mean, it's kind of mind blowing the different things that you've accomplished and how many different almost careers you've had over the course of your life so far. And you know, in anesthesia, and then even at one point as the dean of a medical school. Um, but then you've kind of settled into this area of wellness in the recent years. And so I'm just curious, first, what brought you to medicine in the first place? And then how you ended up realizing the importance of wellness and kind of dedicating your life to that. Yeah, so um, medicine in the first place is really easy. When I was nine, I felt like I was going to die. I had a strep throat or strep, <laughs> strep infection. And... Uh, pediatrician came to the house, gave me a shot. I think it was streptomycin in that era or penicillin. Yeah. Um, and in a day I was feeling great. And I said, that's what I want to do in life. You that's can, amazing. You can yeah. get paid for helping people feel well. And so that changed it. When I got into anesthesia, um, I got, uh, this is a somewhat of a funny story, <laughs> but it's true. Um, I got asked to be one year out of residency or out of fellowship. I got asked to chair or co-chair the section on cardiovascular anesthesia at UC San Francisco. Okay. And the reason I did was because no one wanted to work with the surgeons. They were oh. tough. Cardiac surgeons are fairly difficult to work with, at least in that era. Um, but all they cared about was outcome for their patients. And that was what I cared about. So I said, what determined outcome? And we had we got the database for the entire state of California. I was at UC San Francisco at the time, University of California, San Francisco. And it was age. So I said, the more than BUN, more than any other medical factor, more than kidney function, brain function, anything else, it was the age of the patient. So the same patient undergoing aortic reconstruction who is 75 had three times the complication risk of dying, who was 65, everything else being equal, nine times of 55. So I said, is there a chance of us trying to make people physiologically younger in the two weeks surrounding surgery? Wow. And so that's where this started. And it was trying to get people younger and motivated. And, and what you found is we knew the factors but no one had put them together. So that's how real age started wow. um, and putting those together. And, and uh, along the way, as you, as, you, as you say, so you found out that aging was the key thing. And if you look at the data really carefully now, we're not sure, but we think um, that aging can be, if, if we're slowing it now, we're doing what we call rejuvenation, meaning if you slow the rate of aging by physical activity, by food choices, by stress management, you can probably be 30 years younger than your calendar age at age 55. So at age 55, you can be functionally 25. Wow. Um, but we're undergoing, there's a, there's a real um, sense in the aging community, the amount of money in aging research is now um, logarithm has now logarithmically expanded for about uh, 25 years. And that's beginning to turn the concept of what aging is, the research is, to the point where maybe we can get much younger than our calendar ages. So we don't know whether you're going to be able to reverse or just keep it where it is. 
So that's where, I mean, that's how I got into the, the whole concept by, by looking at what is happening, what data we had. It is you, you realize that the potential for human beings, for human capital, if you will, for us living healthier, longer with less disability and a less medical cost is really there now. That's amazing. And I actually, so I did the real age questionnaire this morning because I was curious because I actually just had my 30th birthday, which was a big milestone for me um, and found out that my real age was 18, which is kind of exciting, but it also so made see, me you're, think, you're, you know, you're, so we should say, say to your husband that he's <laughs> rocking the cradle. <laughs> well, I don't know what his real age would probably be younger than that. Who knows? <laughs> Um, but so taking that survey made me think about a lot of different things and my own health behaviors. So when you put that together, when you think about helping someone, you know, decrease their kind of biological age, what are some of the most, the term real age, real age, their (laughs) real age, what are, what are the most important factors or where do you start to get kind of the most bang for your buck? So, um, the, the two most important are stress which is a 32-year effect. That is, when you have three major life stresses in the same year, if you don't modify it, you're the equivalent in disability and death rate of 32 years older. Um, The second one is um, food choices from the worst to the best. That's about a 27-year effect. Third is... um, if you will, physical activity, and fourth is is toxins in general, like okay. tobacco. Okay. But um, physical activity is a um, is one that people. Um, in fact, this year the Cleveland Clinic data is exactly confirms our data from whatever it was, nineteen ninety nine, when we first published it. Um, that's about a ten year effect, and that is from being a couch potato to being uh, getting not being the most fit, but doing the minimum for maximum benefit in fitness. Um, We don't have, except for one data point, the Cleveland Clinics this year, we don't have where intensity beyond that makes a difference. But this year, the data is pretty good that it does, but it's only one study. So we, we use four studies in humans, but the Cooper Clinic, the alumni data from Penn, from Harvard, um, our own Cleveland Clinic data all show that getting to 11 met capable when you're 55 gives you a 10-year benefit. Now, whether you get more benefit if you can do 15 or 16 mets or whatever, um, we don't know except in one study where it gave you another two to three-year benefit. So it may be that... Um, the human body, we we just don't have enough data points on that, you know, waiting for people to age that that well after they get in. in um, but it may be that intensity matters in addition. But anyway, it is, it is, it's those same things that we use on the outcome data for the six normals. Yeah. We didn't choose those randomly. We got those from the the Medicare. We, we, the reason we have those is we looked at the Medicare database and those made a difference to how long and how well people lived. So when when it comes to physical activity, you talked a little bit about intensity, but can you talk about the importance of getting regular dedicated physical activity or exercise versus being active throughout the day or kind of like getting your steps versus doing 30 minutes of aerobic activity or strength training activity? Yeah, we don't have real good data on that because you'd okay. have to randomly allocate people to those different those groups. groups to get it. But what we have is that if you look at um, any physical activity, saying what does walking, just walking do, 10,000, and 10,000 isn't more than 20% than 8,000. It's much more than that. 10,000 breaks down insulin resistance. Conversely, 12,000 steps a day doesn't get you much more than 10,000 in general activity because it is 10,000 that breaks down, it changes metabolic functioning. But in any case, um, walking gets you about 4.8 of the 10 years. Okay. So just by getting people off the couch, which is 
um, obviously a, a start for many people gets you a huge benefit, gets you four years younger, five years younger. Um, then it is the, the second thing it looked like was resistance activity, not because it gives you the biggest bang, but because if you do cardio without resistance, you tend to get injured. Um, so the, the resistance gives you about one sixth of the benefit okay. and uh, three six go to uh, or two, two to three six go to cardio that is intense exercise. And then there's an extra special benefit um, from jumping. Um, and the reason for jumping, um, at 30 you won't appreciate this, but <laughs> the reason for jumping is in fact uh, that it preserves, uh, it, it's the only thing we know that aggregates bone, hip, and spine. Okay. And somehow preserves um, discs. So you'd think the discs, if you jump, you would get, but they stay spongy. You know, it's it's almost like a muscle. It's that stress. Right? Mm -hmm. In your muscle, if you, if, as you do resistance, you tear it. And it's almost like it builds up over the next day and says, you can't tear me tomorrow, right? Well, apparently the disc does the same thing and the bone does the same thing. It gets stimulated and says, I'm going to get stronger and spongier and stay uh, functional longer. So there is a benefit to uh, Some jumping and, and jumping. yeah, and I don't, you know, I used to play squash a lot, and we used to do jump rope as a as a intense cardio exercise, yes. and so that's a great exercise. That's still what I try and do. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic, and it makes sense what you say about the resistance exercise because we think about that even for preventing, you know, preventing injuries when you're doing cardio, but also preventing falls later on in life or hip fractures or things like that. The strength is so important. Right. To pull yourself up from the fall, actually. Right. Um, the other thing, and just, just so you, as a, as, as a fun thing, if you want to see it at the end of one of the Oz shows, I challenged Mehmet, Dr. Oz to uh, jump rope oh. and they had to go to commercial. I was killing him so badly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll look that up. We'll link to that one at the end. Um, and then going back to stress, which you said was the most kind of important or could give you the biggest benefit, you talk about having big stressful events or experiencing stressful events in your life. And a lot of those we don't have a lot of control over. So what are some of the things that we can do to buffer the impact of those events? Yeah. So the event isn't what is stressful. It is your reaction Response. to it. And the big stressful events, a marriage, forced to move having a child, the, the ones you'd expect, Normal if events. you will. Um, those are major life events that change the way you perceive it. And the way you do it is, is whether it is deep breathing or meditation or guided imagery or progressive muscle relaxation, there actually are 12 different techniques people do. Um, but it's to find one of those techniques that you can do and practice it regularly. So I do deep breathing is mine. Um, and so doing it five minutes morning and night is a regular. And then, you know, someone cuts me off in a minor stress. I reach for my belly button yeah. and do deep breathing. <laughs> um, but um, the point it, and we can teach it easily. So we have an online program called Stress Free Now. If you go to clevelandclinicwellness.com, you can buy the program. It's about $50. Um, but it is it goes through all 12 techniques and it's wonderful at helping people learn one of the techniques and practice it. Definitely. And I actually, I did that program when I was in med school and we were working on the research project together, actually. So yes, it's a very good program, um, which is funny. We just as, as an aside about the way that we probably first met was when I was in medical school as part of our program, we all do a year of research and I was lucky enough to do mine studying a uh, tool that you had made to... I, I was lucky enough that you did it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But um, trying to study how we could collect information about patients' wellness behaviors in primary care and then help to better direct them to the right resources in that primary care setting. And it was a very, um, a very interesting project and something that, you know, I'm still really interested in and trying to focus on how can we improve the delivery of primary care in order to focus on these more proactive behavioral interventions rather than the reactive prescribing of medications and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. So we, we are doing, and I don't know if your 
practicing in an area that we've started this, but in the e-coaching, I don't know if you've been. I don't seeing, think we have that in our um, in our but, department yet. Yeah, in the, at, are you, you're at the Cleveland Clinic. I am. I'm at. I'm in Lakewood, um, yeah, so but we're in can, the residency program, so it's a little different. Yeah. So all you have to do is on Epic, go to eCoach. Okay. Just put in eCoach and Epic, and and primary care any oh. primary care patient can get it. Oh, okay. So I'll have to tell that is, to everyone is, in my program. It is in Lorraine and Avon. So, okay. Oh, uh, it's in Avon. Yeah. Oh well, that's that's pretty close to our. Yeah. To so Lakewood, that's what I'm so. saying. So anyway, just I'll check that in out. in the orders. <laughs> you just put in eCoach. All right. E dash coach, I think. I will spread that. Um, anyways, in terms of talking about things that we can do to improve our longevity or improve our real age, um, what are some of the things that you do or, you know, habits that you use on a regular basis in your day to day life and maybe how those have changed over the years? So I'm smiling now because I do, there are 157 things you wow. can do um, that make a difference to how. Uh, fast you age or not. And I do 155 of them pretty well. Wow. Um, the uh, 154. And where, do, where would people find out what this what these well, things you, are? You took the real age test. So it's in so, there. Yeah. And so at the end, it okay. comes up with a extra things you can do. Okay. At, at 12 years younger at age 30, you may not have had <laughs> any come up. But, but anyway, so there are 150, they, and so they come up and, and you can choose what you want to do or not do. Okay. And there's a list of all of those things. Okay. Um, but um, the two I don't do perfectly are manage stress and sleep. Okay. Um, but everything else I do pretty well. So <laughs> um, in other words, the I do do stress management. I um, do, and, and we'll, we'll end we'll up get getting the when yeah. way in, into the program, but it's not there yet. Yeah. Um, I do, uh, food choices are pretty darn good. Um, the, uh, I do all the four components of physical activity we just talked about. I don't smoke. Um, those are the big ones. I do take all the, the supplements and medications that have been shown to make a difference in your rate of aging. Um, so it, when it comes to it, I, I, you know, my blood pressure, you know, I'm, I'm, Knock, you're, well, knock you're, on some wood. Well, tell people what is your I, I do. real age and your chronological age. So I'm I'm uh, 72 now and I'm 52 real Which, age. So that's I'm incredible. About 20 years younger. I'm a little more than 20 years younger. That's amazing. So anyway, but yeah. So I want to I want to get into some more details about so as far as your exercise routine. I know I've seen your treadmill desk before in your office, but yeah, what if you else? go right above here, I, I offer you have that one to at you. home too. <laughs> well, it's not a treadmill. It's not. It's a regular treadmill, okay. and, and there's a uh, a Schwinn bike, okay, and a set of weights, there you um, go. and a rowing machine, and so those are the things I. So, um, you, I don't know if you know, I played competitive squash and captain the U.S. team in the wow. I did not know. I did not read that Pan American in Games. Your bio. Anyway, um, so the average um, five game squash match was forty eight minutes. Okay. So I got in the habit of doing forty eight minutes of cardio three okay. times a week, um, even when I'm not playing squash. So that's what I do. Um, so Wednesday evening, Saturday and Sunday, I do those. And when I'm on, you know, today is a uh, a vacation day, and so every time I get a vacation day, I do it as well. Um, and then I do uh, weights twice a week. Okay. I do um, jump rope every morning, um, and I uh, I don't go to bed other than last night without ten thousand steps. So wow. If you look at my pedometer, well, you can see I've got sixteen thousand so far today. Already today, wow. And on, that's one of the few times the whole. I just made 10,000 that day. So okay. um, I won't, I'll, I'll try, I'll get 10,000 one way or another okay. um, every day. Um, and I might miss three days a year. Um, so that's. That's consistency. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's what I do for, uh, for physical activity. Very good. Now I promised myself that someday I'll get back to squash because I love the game. Um, but if you're, as probably will experience if you're a competitive athlete if you are not trained do not have the time to train for it you still try and do it competitively right 
and it's it it it, it is your body says you're not right. ready for it. Right? I've yes, I'm starting to experience that myself. Yes, definitely. <coughs> Excuse me. It's so, a different type of training. Yeah. So I so even in, when I was dean at at uh, Sydney Upstate, I would play with the Cornell squash team. I was still good enough to compete with the number one and two guy, but unfortunately I didn't have time to compete with, right. you know, to keep in shape. So I'd come home after those matches on <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, and my, my <laughs> wife would think I was a, or need, <laughs> need an ambulance to get me to the neck, you know, you, right. you, you, uh, exhaust whatever muscle right. reserve you have and, and you, you you need a few days to recover. Yes. So that's, well, that's an interesting point though, too. And I think a lot of people listening can relate with the difference between short-term performance goals versus long-term health goals and how maybe you shifted at some point you gave up that competitive environment right. realizing, okay, I want to do exercise in a way with my long-term health in mind. Right. But I, with the goal that, that I am when I, when I get enough time, when yeah. I retire, when I do whatever I'm uh -huh. uh, going to do in my next uh, phase <laughs> of life, um, to carve out enough time to, um, to play, to play competitively again. That's amazing. You know, so they have age groups, you know, and so yeah. you, you can do that. Oh, that's incredible. I will love to come watch that. That would be great. <laughs> so well, I play, you know, there's a, there's a thing called Metro Squash, um, which is uh, underprivileged uh, kids being introduced to it as a way of inducing or introducing discipline, and and so they invited me, and I could I could stay with the best kid for seven points. And then, wow, <laughs> and then I that's was still too, pretty good. <laughs> then I was exhausted. You know? <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, so you also mentioned, you know, stress is something that you could maybe do better at, but you do do some deep breathing. So what does that practice look like for you? So for me, it's just, I, I literally put my finger on my belly button so you can do it. I, I, I decided I had to do something that I could do with my eyes open because a lot of my stress is, um, and this started in California. If you, if you live in San Francisco and drive in San Francisco, you need something for stress relief for the behavior of other, yes. <laughs> and so I would put my finger on my belly button and just take practice deep, deep breathing. Breaths. And sometimes I close my eyes and, and do it, but it's normally it's just breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth and, and, but concentrating on how your finger is moving, your finger should move away from your body. Most athletes will do that. So I would think most people who are listening to this podcast will do that. But that most diaphragmatic but, breathing. Yeah, but most humans, most yeah. Americans don't do it. Now, we all do it when we're born, but we don't do it. So it's just practicing that. And so, but it is, it's focusing so much on breathing that you can't focus on anything else. And do you do that at other times of the day or just when you feel some no, stress I do coming it, on? No, I do it morning and evening morning and as evening. a routine day. Okay keep the practice up. Got it. Got but it's it. only five minutes. You know, it doesn't take Just very long. Thing. It's five minutes. But it's the consistency again that helps you build that muscle, right? I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. That helps you build the practice so that you can pull it out when you need it. Right. Yeah. You mentioned also taking some supplements and medications that have shown to improve longevity. Can you talk about what those are for yeah, you? Yeah. So there are, I call it, um, eight plus four plus two plus one. So okay. the reason there are eight where there's enough data in humans that it makes a difference to longevity, at, starting at certain times. There are four that are probable that have low risk. Okay. There are two where there's substantial risk, but there's probable benefit. And then there's uh, one coming along that we don't know how it will occur. Okay. Um, but the FDA just approved, um, it's now a year and a half ago, um, the first studies on drugs with aging biomarkers. So meaning it's uh, the FDA is set up to look at gastrointestinal drugs and gastrointestinal disease and the modification of it with drugs. They've never been set up to look at something like aging because okay. mm -hmm. aging was never considered a disease. Right. But maybe it is a change. And so 
They're studying uh, NADR and metformin are the two that are now under, um, if you will, IND in that area. But the, um, at least as I understand it, but the, um, the things that have been shown is simple things. So a multivitamin morning and evening, half of one morning and half of one in the evening. And if you look at the 10-year data, which the, the headlines would show when you were in the beginning of medical school, throw away your vitamins, it's useful, right. useless. But in the 20-year data, it showed a 25% reduction in cardiovascular disease and a 20% or 18% reduction in all-cause cancer mortality. And is so, that better to split it up morning and evening? or Yeah, because you, you want to stay, you, that's a theoretic better. We, okay. No study has been done on it. And, but the reason is because the water-soluble ones, you will, you will okay. urinate out in 12 to 16 hours. You see that with a change in color in your right. urine. So that's why it's, it's probably. But in any Got case, it. the 20-year data is done by the same investigators who did the 10-year data, but it didn't get sensationalism because it was continue your multi, but you know, it's not a very, <laughs> not very good headline. Yeah. Um, the second one is vitamin D3 or D2, D3. It's to get it to a level of 50 to 80. The third is um, a is calcium and magnesium. The fourth is a baby aspirin morning and night. And that is a time thing. So you're still in the period where you do extreme sports, if you will. So you don't want to do it if you're still doing extreme sports because aspirin increases bleeding risk if you have an accident. And you don't want to do it probably before 45 and in women or before 35 in men uh, based on the benefit risk of heart disease, stroke, and cancer. But it does all three of those. Anyway, and then DHA is for your brain. It's So if you don't have salmon or ocean trout, 900 milligrams of DHA a day. I think that was either five or six. That sounds close, yeah. <laughs> um, and then a probiotic and CoQ10. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. And the the CoQ10 and the and the statin are for people over the age of fifty. So it's not not it's for for those pursuing health when they hit fifty. <laughs> and and then and are then, those t- taken together the CoQ10 with the statin, or would you just take the CoQ10 matter. before? So the the point is that statins will reduce the blood level of coenzyme Q10, a key thing for energy. And where we looked at that, where we discovered that was actually an accident. We were, um, I had a bunch of executive health patients who would work out on a treadmill. And when you put them on a statin for the first time, yes. they couldn't do as much exercise afterwards. So if you added the CoQ10, they can it helps. Re, re, return to their former level of um, extreme competitiveness. <laughs> um, they were extreme, you know, I, this was a group of patients I had who would say, can we, if we keep doing exercise at a very intense level, not have the decrement in maximum heart rate as we get older? And so there are um, seven of them still doing this and not showing much decrement, no place near the the 220 minus calendar age that guys are supposed to see. They're not seeing any, they're seeing 220 minus calendar age divided by two or something. Minus their real age, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> so that's right. Um, so huh. they're they're seeing much less of a change. So okay. that was in that group of Very what you would call crazy competitors. You know, they'd come out of their, <laughs> their exercise stress test and yeah. lie to the next guy about how much they had done. <laughs> so the next so guy would, would feel like he had to stay on it for long, <laughs> longer and more intense. <laughs> oh, wow. That's funny. Very good. Okay. Um, then I want to start getting into nutrition and I want to start talking about your new book, which is out now. It just came out today. Just came out. Um, so what to eat when, and for those who are watching, we'll just hold it up here. <laughs> Thank you. But um, I want to talk about nutrition in general, but also, you know, what to eat, but also when to eat. Um, so maybe we can talk about when first, since that's more of the topic of the book, but it's been especially lately, there's been tons of, of coverage about fasting, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding, all of these fasting mimicking diets. Lots of people are experimenting with it in different ways, but 
you went through all the research and the recent data. And what did you find? Right. So the, the data support strongly that we should be eating more of our calories early in the day, less later. So the, the phrase is, one of our phrases is, eat when the sun is out. Okay. So if you went in the, <laughs> uh, in the dining room here, you yeah. would have seen I have a, a, a bunch of fake suns, a bunch oh, of model suns. <laughs> to keep the sun out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. To go on the, it's actually to go on TV programs oh, okay. that we're going to go on, you know, okay. as, as a uh, prop, a prop, if you okay. will. So you want to eat when the sun is out. And if you need one of the things in, in that lamp to eat with, you shouldn't be eating um, at that time. It's an time. easy way to think about it. Um, so the, the, the data were accumulated over the last seven to 10 years in animals, but in the last two to three years. So one of the studies is in um, Spanish women who were trying to lose weight. And they randomly allocated them, since they have their biggest meal at lunch, was to eat their biggest meal before 2 p.m. or after 3 p.m. And the group that ate before 2 p.m., same number of calories, lost 25% more weight. Um, lost it's fat a lot. as well. It's a significant no, it's, it's, it, there were huge changes. The data from the Brigham and Women's uh, Metabolic Lab and how they get people to not see the outside. So they keep them in a room where they can't see the outside. Okay. They, they're each of their rooms. Yeah. They're allowed to do Netflix, but no time of day notices. Wow. So no TV. And they keep them there for 20 weeks. Wow. I mean, huge periods of time. And they showed that their metabolic rate is higher in the morning than in the afternoon. So the same calories that you eat in the morning where you're non-diabetic, you end up being pre-diabetic in the evening. And it made sense teleologically because after a hunt or um, gathering, you'd want to store food so you could survive until right. you could get more food or another successful hunt. So in the evening, you want to store food. In the morning, you use it for that hunt. And so sense. teleologically, it makes sense. But it actually, there's a whole bunch of studies now in the last three years that show that eating more early and less later. So another one of our things is um, eat dinner for breakfast. So you can cook in the evening when most of us have more time, but eat it in the morning. Eat it in the morning. So um, that, that's the, the point. Now, the other thing that came out recently is the best time to exercise for losing blood pressure, for lowering blood pressure, is in the evening. And why is that? It's probably because... It's a way of increasing your metabolic rate and not gaining weight by exercising in the evening. Now, we always say to people, exercise whenever you feel like right. it so that you'll actually do the do exercise because so few Americans do, so few of the people of the world do exercise. So um, do it whenever, but if you, if, you, if you can do it anytime, the evening is actually a way of increasing your metabolic rate if you're not going to eat the wind way. But I think, I mean, I've, when one of the things in the book is how to switch your eating pattern from evening eating to morning eating or to morning and lunch eating. And it's pretty easy. It, it turns out um, if you do it cold turkey, if you make it about four days, you lose your hunger because you're eating in the morning. But if you do it the gradual way that we show in the book, it's just as easy to do. Pretty easy, which is, I mean, it's interesting because you talk about how, you know, evolutionarily this made sense, but now the way that most people's lives are set up is completely the opposite. We have a lot of people skipping breakfast. We have a lot of people, you know, being busy at work all day and then coming home and eating a huge meal or eating more of their carbohydrates or desserts late in the evening, snacking before bedtime, um, which is interesting to find out that really this is coming back to a kind of backfire. Yeah, and that's, it may be, you know, when you look at it, although we're eating more calories ever since 1983, we ate the same number of calories from 1858 to 1990 to 1983, and then we started cultural changing to eat more. But in addition, we gradually moved our, our food to later in the day. <coughs> Excuse me. And that later in the day is really a bad um, program. So not only now, I, I've got to tell you something else about the book. So 
in the beginning of the book, we have the, the concept of um, what to eat when, that is, when is the best time to eat, as well as what to eat. And you probably know, I mean, it's it's healthy fats, avoid simple sugars, simple carbs, um, added sugars, and foods with saturated fat. The Avoiding the foods with saturated fat is to avoid the proteins that come with saturated fat, carnitine, less than choline. But in the back, we have specifics of what to eat, for example, when, when you exercise. exercise or what to eat um, if you're uh, trying to get pregnant or what to eat. I mean, all kinds of things. A lot when of different have, situations. When you have hot flashes or what to eat, um, you know, if you're on a first date or what to eat, um, you know, all oh, kinds of fun things. Very so, good, fun, practical advice. Yeah, so, that's, so that, that was, those were the, the fun things that actually had data on it. Very interesting. And it's interesting too, just thinking about, you know, even when, when so people are trying to do this intermittent fasting, it seems that most people I talk to tend to use their window later in the day versus earlier. And I don't know if it's just a result of the way our lives are set up and being used to eating the big meal at dinner, but in fact, we can probably get a lot more benefit if we shift our window to being, yeah. like you say, eating dinner for breakfast, eating yeah. a larger lunch, um, which is also similar to the way we you know, years ago, lunch used to be the biggest meal of the day. We just actually went to go visit my husband's family in Germany. They live in a small town and they still do that. They have a huge meal together for lunchtime and then dinner is a lot lighter. Yeah. So that's exactly right. It should be a lot lighter. But in fact, intermittent f- fasting does seem, or what I really, it's time restricted feeding does work very well. Um, and the, if you will, the, the fasting mimicking diet seems to work, although we don't have long-term data on it. But the meaning you want to get a period of at least 12 and hopefully 14 hours. So I do it from 7 a.m. to 10, 10, 7 p.m. to 10 a.m. Okay. So I try and cut off food at 7 p.m. except for water and coffee um, and then uh, not eat again till 10 a.m. And it works pretty easily um, and it works even easily in a medical environment. Yeah, definitely. Well, definitely, because a medical environment, I was thinking, too, is one of the harder um, the harder times to do it. At least in my experience, I've seen a lot of doctors or, like you say, surgeons who work all day and then go home and eat a big meal for dinner because they're kind of working through lunch or you have a lot of shift workers who are working in the evening. And so, I mean, do you have recommendations for that, for people who are working in the evening? Yeah. How can they try to maximize so, this effect? So they should... In fact, keep on a normal sun, if you will, only eat when the sun is up. Okay. But essentially, they they should be eating, um, if you will, before they go to work, um, they should eat their bigger meals and then um, have a very small meal when they get home before they go to sleep. So they, now we didn't, believe it or not, we wrote that, we wrote about, 20 or 30 extra chapters that aren't in the book. The one on shift work, we allude to it, but we didn't include it in the book. And the reason is there wasn't enough data showing that okay. really worked. Um, so um, I'm going to try and rope in another learner student yeah. to help us with Look this with our, data. since we have nurses who yeah. uh, work, um, if you will, during yeah. the night. Yeah. So I'm going to try and I'm, Tomorrow I'm I'm sending <laughs> off I've written it already sending off a, a IRB proposal to um, Kelly Hancock our chief okay. of nursing um, to say can we get are you interested in doing so we'll take four words of night four words of nurses and shift them to the one way of eating and four keep on the same schedule and see if we can in fact lower the the um, weight gain that and the diseases that. Um, shift workers have. I mean, it's a, it's a real problem. It's a real problem. And it's something I, I hope that people would be receptive to it. I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that I overhear in the hospital in nursing units is nurses talking about whatever diet they're trying. I've heard a lot about lately about the intermittent fasting or about the ketogenic diet or various things that people are trying. So it would be interesting to see what kind of data you can find out. Right. Well, there we have to we have to create the data. Meaning, right. we'll have to do the experiments right. with them because no one's done them. Right. Um, you mentioned a little bit about what to eat. So, if you're interested in joining in a new yeah, study, a new study. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Very interesting. 
Um, yeah, so you talked a little bit about. So for those what listening, <laughs> Julie is great at both doing studies <laughs> and doing data analysis on it. She did. So don't give so that, that don't joy give that. up. <laughs> right, right. I'm always looking for more research studies to do. <laughs> um, it has been harder to do in residency, that's for sure. But but it's important to do. I think you need to do the study and have the data in order to be able to move forward. Right. Um, you mentioned a little bit about what to eat. Um, can you give us an example of a day of your what you would eat in a typical day? Yeah, I mean, I I was worried that when you came here, you were going to say, where are the salmon burgers? Because I talk about it. But I'll take you down. The freezer has just loaded with salmon, salmon burgers. burgers. But okay. I, but I, I typically, um, in fact, today I had two salmon burgers for breakfast. Okay. Um, so um, since it's a holiday and since we had a lot of grilled vegetables, I was debating actually a egg white omelet oh. with a lot of vegetables. So I, I will often do that on, on a uh, Saturday or Sunday or holiday um, right after exercise. So I got, I've got i gotten used to exercising before I, I eat. And then, uh, so I had a couple salmon burgers and some spinach. Okay. And then uh, as soon as we're done, I'm going to, I think I'm going to have either a couple more salmon burgers or I'm going to use some of the veggies and do an egg white uh, vegetable omelet. That sounds and good. And then at dinner, I'll have a salad, a plain lettuce with, with some other, be- you know, tomatoes and set and uh, balsamic vinegar and olive oil. And that's, that's my dinner. Okay. Um, so that's a very, um, it may sound boring, but I love it. And it's a very it typical works. dinner. It's typical. I love typical it. day. Um. I also wanted to ask you and about- if they ever find something that's <laughs> toxic in those salmon burgers, I'm in real trouble. You're in trouble. <laughs> Guess just getting the good quality salmon. That's about it. Um, I also wanted to ask you about coffee because I know you're a big coffee drinker and I know that we are constantly hearing about how coffee is good for you or how it may not be good for you. Can you, can you yeah, give us data, an overview the of the data state is of the data? Clear. It's, 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 it's just like egg yolks. The data is really clear and only people who are trying to sell books without real science would say otherwise. otherwise. So um, the data is very clear. If you're a fast metabolizer of coffee, 82 to 88% of Americans are. Okay. How do you tell you have a cup of coffee like this, regular roast, and if you, it's this is 12 ounces, okay. if you can have that in an hour without getting a headache, okay. gas, heart arrhythmias, abnormal heartbeats, gastric upset or anxiety, you're a fast metabolizer. Okay. For fast metabolizers, the more coffee you have, the better. Mm -hmm. So six or more cups a day, you decrease Parkinson's risk and Alzheimer's risk by 40% or more. You decrease type 2 diabetes risk by about 25%. You decrease 11 cancers, including breast and probably prostate. We don't know that one yet, but breast and colon and et cetera by between 20 and 40%. So the data is really good. Uh, and and even if you've got NASH, uh, non-alcoholic steatorrheic hepatitis, if you've got, um, if you will, a fatty liver disease, um, coffee helps protect against fibrosis. So it's probably one of the best foods. Now, it turns out uh, 50% of the benefit is from the caffeine and 50% is from the polyphenols that come with coffee. That is in the studies comparing decaffeinated with caffeinated. And these are all epidemiologic studies, so we don't have really perfect data on it. But it looks like half of the benefit is the caffeine and half is the the, the color, the stuff that's colored in the coffee. Those antioxidants. Interesting. So if you're a slow metabolizer, should you avoid coffee altogether? Yeah, the slow metabolizers only get side effects. Okay. So So it's really not worth it. So for those 12 to 18% of Americans, yeah, if they're a slow metabolizer, people always say, well, what can I do? I'm a slow metabolizer. I say they do all the other 156 things. Right. You know, because there's so many other things you can do. But coffee is one of the, the things you can do if you're a fast metabolizer. Interesting. And do you know, are there now genes that are associated with whether you're slow or fast if you were to have genetic testing? or Yes, okay. but they're not perfect. Not perfect. So, yeah, there there are, it, it, it's the CYP okay. 
uh, set of genes okay. that, that are associated with that. Okay. And so um, there are uh, genotypes you can do, uh, nutrigenomics, et cetera, but the, uh, the easiest way is to try it. Just that end of one experiment. Right. Figure out what you're... So an end of one experiment for the, for the people listening, do you want to say what that is? Basically doing an experiment with one variable on yourself and seeing what symptoms you have or what reaction you personally have. Because everyone, like we know, has very different genes and predispositions. And so when we do these big randomized controlled trials, you know, there's such variety in those populations of people that we're studying. Right. So N of one is you're the N. Yep. <laughs> you're the You're the one. <laughs> um, and then how do say you're drinking six to eight cups of coffee per day. I am. How do you make sure, I know you said this was the other thing that you're working on, but how do you also make sure that that doesn't hinder sleep? Usually in fast metabolizers, uh, if you stop at six or 7 yes. PM, it doesn't. Okay. So in fact, when I was on the FDA study section, this is the advisory committees, um, that the head of the drug division at that time was a guy named Carl Peck, and he watched me drinking uh, caffeinated, I was caffeinated beverages as well as coffee at that time. Okay. I've given up all beverages other than coffee now, uh, coffee and water. And uh, he said, uh, you must have to get up at night to keep your level, to get another <laughs> caffeinated drink to keep your level stable. stable. <laughs> he was a, he, he, he was into pharmacokinetics okay. and, and, and yeah. that, and it was true. I yeah. would have to get up in the, when I got up in the wow. middle of the night, I would have to have uh, some <laughs> caffeine to, to be able Help to stay to asleep. Back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. if, so I don't know that that's, I, I usually stop around uh, seven or 8 PM now. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, I usually finish with three questions or yeah, three questions. Um, we, we've kind of already touched on some of these, but I'd love to get your your answers, maybe kind of to summarize and wrap up. So the first one is the three top three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health. Um, I'm going to ask you these too, because okay. people are probably interested I've answered in these before, but I don't know if I remember my answer, so they may have changed. <laughs> so the best thing I did was choose my mate. So I've been married 46 years. And wow. so having a supportive mate and um, having that relationship and someone to fall back on is incredibly important. So that was number one and 10 times more important than everything else probably. Um, the second is I um, live, if you will, as close to the way I teach other yeah. people too. So I do stress management daily. I do physical exertion um, or at least stairs and walking daily and jumping. Um, and uh, I avoid toxins. So, um, and probably the third thing is I'm lucky enough to have a passion in life. You know, in other words, you, you probably can tell that um, getting people to change behavior to uh, be healthier. Um, is a passion for me. And so I wouldn't still be working if it weren't for having that passion. So I think that's an important component. Okay, that. your turn. My turn. Oh, wow. Now I have to, I don't know. I want to just use yours. <laughs> <laughs> I will say um, the, um, the mate or the people that you surround yourself with, I think that, that for me is incredibly important. And I would say we've only been married for three years, but I think I chose a very good mate as well. Um, and then just trying to build those relationships and spend time with my family that those, because at the end of the day, those are kind of the most important things. And that's why, you know, why we want to help people be healthier and why we want to live longer is so that we can spend more time with our loved ones. So I would, I would agree with that. Um, I would say... I would also say that the sense of purpose for me has been very, very important. And it's something I've only been beginning to discover and has evolved over the past few years. Obviously, I am just starting out in my career, but that sense of purpose or feeling like you have a bigger purpose here in the world. For me, I have a strong faith. So connecting that with my faith is very important to me. Um, and then the third to try to roll all these things in one. Um, 
I think that in the past, I think when I answered this before, I said CrossFit because to me, CrossFit involves functional movements, regular activity. It involves eating basically real food, not eating processed foods or sugar. And it involves community, um, which again is, I think, very important to me. So I guess I can try and roll some of those things into one, but it's hard to pick just three. <laughs> no, it's, it, it is. No, you live you you live a life of of purpose. So that's correct. I mean, it, that, it seems that way to, that that to me you live it. That's what I so. try. That's what I try to do. But we're all constantly working and evolving. Um, the next question is one thing which you kind of already answered this. One thing that you know would have a big impact on your health, but you struggle to implement. So you had mentioned stress and sleep. Can you elaborate on? That yeah. a little bit more well it's it is when you're taking on a big hairy audacious project that um people um there are a lot of things you have to move to get those done and sometimes you can't so for example in our project i couldn't get uh, that implemented totally even though i strongly believed in it and you have to if you will, push and keep pushing. So I think uh, the stress is part of that uh, passion of changing things. Um, and sleep is one where I used to love to stay up and watch the uh, daily show, the comedy of the, of the daily show. Yeah. So now I have, now I play it the next day. <laughs> so I now, I now try and go to bed an hour earlier because okay. I, I, my wake up time is the same every day. Right. So I try and go to bed get an, an hour earlier to try and get that extra sleep. So Very I'm pretty much uh, succeeded in in doing that, thanks to uh, the apps of playing, <laughs> playing the daily now that we can watch TV, the anytime. daily show the next day. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And you bring up a good and, point. And what about you? Oh, for things that I'm working on, for me now, it's definitely stress management. That's something that I'm really trying to work on. I do a pretty good job with sleep because I I just find I don't function well when I don't get enough sleep. But um, I've I've done some mindfulness and meditation practices right now I'm doing, um, more of like a biofeedback where basically you're kind of watching your heart rate and trying to keep your heart rate in coherence as you're doing deep breathing exercises. I find that it's a little bit more objective and it, it's something that I've been enjoying lately. Um, but just being able to go back to that during the day and not letting, myself get caught up in constantly worrying or thinking about things that I have to do or that I want to do and just being really in the moment working on what I am working on at that time. So I'm sure it will be a lifelong challenge. <laughs> Great. No, it always is. <laughs> um, but you brought up a good point about the stress and kind of how that, that balance between managing stress, but also following your passions and your purpose and how all of these things balance is kind of important. And you're going to have to give and take. You can't do all one 157 things every single day, probably if you want to, you know, if you want to still function, get enough sleep and do all those things. So it's finding the right balance, what works for you and what's best for your health long-term. Last question is what does a healthy life look like to you? Um, if you, if you're saying what will it look like 10 years from now or what does it, there are different questions. Because I, I strongly believe that if if the listeners make it, the, the viewers, listeners, whatever we call them, make it to 2030, there's a 90% chance of a real breakthrough in aging research. So I think it's going to be different. Um, you know, if you look at medicine um, and you were in, in 1940, you would have never thought that blood pressure wasn't a major issue in killing people. You would have never thought we would have had coronary artery stents or we would have had known a lot about um, the exercise, food, and even medications to prevent that. So I really believe we're on this exponential cusp in, in aging. So what it looks like today is trying to do as many of those things that make your real age younger and we'll constantly adapt to some of the studies. So 
if you will, the, the data on eating earlier and time-restricted feeding being useful, we're not there in the year 2000 where they're now there. So I, I think of it, it, you know, my concept is having the energy and having the um, energy and capacity to follow your passions is what I look like as, what I think of as a, a healthy life. And that involves a lot of things. Um, and as you said, friends and, and family are, are key. But there's also, um, I think in 10, in 10 years, we don't know whether you're going to just be able to really stop the aging process or slow it dramatically, or whether you're going to be able to reverse it. So I think it's going to be what, what a healthy life uh, looks like in 10 years may be very different from what it looks like now. Oh, that's exciting. It'll be, so it'll be very exciting to see. We'll hopefully, hopefully we'll... <laughs> I'll be on your podcast in 10, 10 years. 10 years and we'll be talking about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I would agree. So my, I always think about a healthy life as being able to carry out or do what you were put on this earth to do without your health being a hindrance or without having to worry about your health or your ability to function. Um, I think for me, especially now getting into primary care, just seeing how many people are so consumed on a day-to-day basis by their health problems, they're not able to do the things that they are really passionate about. It's very, um, it's sad to see. And I wish that we could help more people um, and well, m- many of those, are, as as we started talking, many of those are self inflicted. At the Cleveland Clinic, as I said, we've taken, we've gone from six percent having six normals to forty three point, I think it's forty three point nine percent or so. So that's you can reverse it. You can get a do over, and that's the joy of of our what you're doing is, and and what I'm doing is still trying to, in fact teach people that in fact this is it's all reversible well well your family is reversible yeah you don't have to live your family genes that whether you turn on those genes or not is what we've learned lifestyle does and you're living the lifestyle and you're and it's it's Mm -hmm. wonderful that you're living the lifestyle that in fact is not having to follow a genetic pathway of disease it's a lot of a lot of freedom for people once they realize that, I think. Oh, that's a good expression. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. This has thank been you. awesome. Um, and we'll have to do it again in 10 years, I guess. I hope so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.